Here is a little different video from the one I normally make. I put together a slideshow of 20 houses that could have been built in the 1920s. Um, th I got these pictures from a lumberyard catalog. And who better to provide you with um, blueprints for homes, you know, than somebody who's going to be selling you the materials for those. And I don't know, some of these were, were for sale. Some of them didn't have prices on them. So I don't know if you could have actually went down to your local lumber yard and picked them up. I mean, I remember one time, and you, you might remember this also, even though this is kind of off track, but uh, me and my brother used to go down to the gas stations and they would give you free maps. And uh, you could tell them, you know, I'm going from California to New York, and they would map out the easiest route for you. And again, it goes back to the same thing. Well, they're probably hoping to sell you the gas to get there, so they're giving away the free map. So this makes sense to me for the advertising part of it and hoping to generate money along with it. So if anybody lives in a house like this, you know, uh, feel free to share it with us in the comment area. I uh, have lived in uh, Southern California my entire life and only got to see homes like this through these uh, pamphlets and, of course, uh, when I go uh, on vacations and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not real common to see a home out here in California with all brick, you know, or even a brick wainscoting. Something goes up about four or five feet, maybe because of the snow. But, of course, the uh, shingles, that's uh, popular all over the place. Um, we, have, we have that out here, kind of a craftsman-style home. And they seem to be real popular in the uh, early 1800s, it looks like, on the East Coast in areas like uh, Massachusetts, where um, kind of like the, the sea captains lived. I see a lot of that. And a lot of these are just one bathroom. You know, you think about it, 1920, I don't know when, you know, I'd like to say that uh, running water for houses and electricity started in 1910, but it was a gradual phase in, you know, as people could afford it or as the uh, local municipalities um, put everything together, got uh, sewage and uh, running water to these homes. Actually, some homes I've seen that were being built in the 1940s had uh, running water, but they did not have the waste system, didn't even have septic tanks. You went outside to go to the bathroom. You had your own private outhouse, of course. So we are approaching number 19 here. So I will let you go here. Hope you I would imagine that this will not be one of my most popular videos, but uh, I'm going to make it anyway. It's going to provide you with an explanation of where the magic number 17 comes from when you're trying to figure out the theoretical length for a hip or a valley. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Here we have two different designs, a more of a three-dimensional view and a flat view. The flat view is what you would see if you were looking at a set of building plans and will also help me explain uh, where this number 17 comes from. So this is what the rafters would look like on a two-dimensional flat drawing. And I kind of wanted to give you an idea of what they would look like in a more of a three-dimensional view. So the theoretical measurements we're looking for are going to be measurements from one point to another point. So this could be from the bottom of the framing plate to the bottom of the rafter, for example. Let's go ahead and shoot back over here. So just to give you an idea of what we were looking at. We're kind of looking at it from this angle here, our hip rafter and our hip rafter here. And of course, the building is 20 foot wide, two foot on center rafter spacing. And if we take and put a one foot by one foot box in here, then we can see where the line that is going to run horizontal or flat that the same line that we're going to use for our 12 and for our 5 and 12 pitch is going to have to be 17 inches if we're going flat here and again I'm just going to kind of I'm not going to spend a lot of time on 
um, this particular scene here in the video because I think it's going to make more sense here in a little bit. So here's the same one foot by one foot square. And here it would be if it was a 10 and 12 pitch. It would go up 10 inches for every 12 inches. But if we go with 5 inches, we go up 5 inches, our rafter, we could use the same, the Pythagorean theorem that we use for figuring our roof rafters, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. We could use it because we have a 90 degree angle here. So we're not, we're not really going to be able to use it. Where's our 90 degree angle from? Our 90 degree angle is going to be down here. We're going to have to slice a section of this to figure it out. So here's what it would look like for our, if we were figuring our common roof rafters. 5 inches up, 12 inches long. Now I want to just kind of turn this thing around here. Now's when it should start to make more sense. We're going to be able to get a 90 degree angle here, right here when we go up. Kind of turn it around here. Now I'm going to remove this section here. So now we have 17 inches, a 90 degree angle. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure our hip or valley rafters. Remember, these are only going to be the theoretical measurements. You're still going to have to do some adjusting um, while you're laying out your roof rafters. So I hope this makes sense. I have met a lot of carpenters that uh, don't know that what the heck this uh, number is and uh, um, don't even ask. And now you know what it is. So in this video, I will provide you with the most common math formula that I used in the construction industry, and it's used to figure out the length of the longer side of a right triangle or a triangle with a 90 degree angle in it. And it's a common math formula for used for figuring out the length of a roof rafter. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're actually going to need in the math formula. So we are not going to know what the C side is, but we are going to need to know what the A and the B sides are going to be. And a lot of times for a when you're figuring out a roof rafter, you're going to have a 5 and 12 pitch, for example. And I believe that's about 22 and a half degrees. And this is going to be, this means that for every 12 inches or every 12 feet that the rise is going to go up five feet for 12 feet and if it's a one foot increment then it's going to go up five inches so for every one foot the rise is going to be five inches and uh, if we have that we have these measurements we can figure out the length of this by just simply having these two numbers. Next up on the list, let's take a look at the formula. And again, I'm going to kind of go through this. You can stop it, pause it, you know, grab a piece of paper and a calculator and work some of this stuff out on your own. And, uh, you know, start the video up and go forward, go backwards, whatever you need to do to uh, drive this into your uh, noggin there. So A squared plus B squared equals c squared. This is the Pythagorean theorem. And it's no more than multiplying a times a. This is side a. And um, this formula works just fine if you if this is side a and this is side b. So in this for our example we're using this is side a and this as side b. So 5 times 5 equals 25. We got to multiply this number by itself to get it to get it squared. And then 12 times 12 equals 144. This is side B. And if we add these two numbers together, 25 plus 144, we get 169. And then if we calculate the square root of 169, we get 13. The length of this side, side C, would be 13. 
Here is a calculator I found on the internet. You might have one at home. Um, you might have one on your computer that you use. And um, most of us know how to multiply numbers together to find the square. If I multiply 5 times 5, then that's going to be 25. So that's not difficult to do. Um, clear that. 12 times 12 equals 144. We add 144 plus 25, we get 169. Now, to find the square root of 169, all we need to do is push the symbol that is going to represent the square root of the number that we had when we added the um, side A squared and side B squared together. So. The square root is just simply the reverse of squaring a number. So if we were to multiply 13 times 13, we're going to get 169. So I hope that makes sense. You're just reversing the process by using the square root symbol. Now I want to point out that if you have a calculator and you don't know what the square root symbol is, um, simply put a number in like 4 and push one of these numbers and then uh, push the equal sign and you got two. So it looks like you can use either one of these. I'm not familiar with this calculator, what it uh, does or doesn't do. My calculator just has the square root symbol on it without anything else and yours might also. But again, it, this if you're trying to find it, you don't know which one it is, just simply put a number in that you know multiplies um, together. So for example, nine. 3 times 3 is 9. Square root of 9 is going to be 3. So just a tip for trying to find the button there uh, if you don't know which one it is. In our last example, I wanted to throw out one more thing, and that is that you can use inches instead of feet. It might be easier for you, and it's easier for me to use inches instead of feet. So, you know, 5 foot converts into 60 inches. You're just going to multiply 60 times 60, um, a times a to get a squared, and just follow the same process through that uh, I just showed you in the previous section. So that is it for the video. I wanted to uh, make this video because I am going to be using it in other videos I'm planning on making in the future. So I'm going to make some videos on... Um, how to figure out uh, complicated roof systems, rafters, hips, um, and even stairs. So there's a lot of things you can use this theorem for. And uh, um, if you do enough construction or you're in the construction industry, uh, make sure that you familiarize yourself with this formula because you're not going to believe how many times uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I came to a job and the carpenters had no idea what I was doing. And I'm like, wow, you know, I just I found it hard to imagine. Some of that stuff you're not going to see today because somebody can pick up a phone and uh, pump in a couple of numbers and they are done with it. So I understand that this video might not be as important as it would have uh, when I was first starting out in construction. Here is another one of those fascinating and exhilarating videos about home construction repairs that I strongly suggest people watch before they start adding different uh, beams, making their floor crawl space girder beams a little larger if they don't have enough room already for their uh, minimum distances or a little smaller than 18 inches or 12 inches. And uh, hopefully by the time you are done watching this video, you will know exactly what in the heck I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and get started. In this example, we have a stem wall that is 1 foot 6 inches, 18 inches from the top of the concrete to the bottom or the top of the soil underneath the crawl space to the top of the stem wall. And 19 and a half inches from the bottom of the joist to the top of the soil. Now most building codes require that 18 inches be the minimum. Now the reason why this is a little larger is because we are using a larger girder beam. 
Now, the building codes also allow for the girder beams to have a one foot or a 12 inch distance from the top of the soil to the bottom of the girder. Now, the reason why I think that is, is because they want the people who need to get underneath the house to make repairs. Uh, they want to give them a little more room in the larger areas, but the 12 inches gives them enough room to crawl under something, but not, uh, you know, be confined as much. If this was all 12 inches, then this probably isn't going to give you much room to work. So that's my thought about that. Feel free to share your comments with us on your reasons if they vary or even if you want to do what some people do and that is simply point out something i already said in my video in the comment area feel free to do that that happens every once in a while so the first suggestion i would like to make before you replace a girder beam with a larger one, if you are not going to have this distance. You know, if I replace this with a larger one, I'm going to have less than 12 inches and my building inspector will not be happy. But an additional concrete footing in the center of the beam to reduce the structural load that it's going to be carrying might actually make your building inspector happy. So this is one of the repair suggestions I would like to make. Just adding an additional concrete footing with the support post and the appropriate hardware to reduce the load. And something like this, if you have a beam that is uh, maybe it's only sagging a half of an inch, three quarters of an inch, you might be able to cut it in the center. You'd have to make sure that it is supported before you cut it. You don't want the floor caving in. Um, support the beam, um, dig the hole that you need, cut it in half, and then when you put your new support footing in and your post, you could simply raise the um, beam up on each side, and then you could always use uh, wedges or shims to adjust if you needed to compensate in some of these other areas. So that's one repair suggestion. Another would be to use a larger beam in width, not in height. So for example, if I had a four by eight, I might wanna use a six by eight or even an eight by eight. And if that's the case, you might need to do some modifications to any of the hardware that is used to make the necessary connections to the floor or the concrete footing. Another suggestion, instead of using wider lumber, a wider beam, would be to use multiple construction standard or LVL boards. And this, of course, becomes uh, really helpful if uh, you can't get larger materials or you have a difficult time moving them underneath or even into the basement. I mean, something like this really can make the difference between you doing a repair yourself and hiring somebody else to do it for you. And of course, this repair would not be complete without suggesting to install additional girder beams with their the appropriate sized concrete footings. And this will definitely make all the difference in the world for um, floors that have undersized floor joists, undersized girder beams, and maybe even overspanned lumber or even lumber that's spaced too far apart. And of course, the last example in the video will be actually providing you with an example of what in the heck I'm actually talking about if you didn't really get it for installing a larger girder beam. So for example, if you had a four by eight, and you had the minimum already 12 inch clearance or even a 13 inch clearance and you install a board that's two inches larger so a 4 by 10 for example then that is going to create a problem for our building inspector and our local building code so this is the main reason why I made the video just to point out that there are other options instead of installing larger beams larger girder beams and uh, reducing the distance here. If you have the room, knock yourself out by all means. Put larger beams in, um, change out the footings if necessary, if you have to. And of course, you, you can do other 
types of repairs. But for those of you who are dealing with the bare minimum, and I would imagine most of us are, I have rarely came to a house. I mean, I have came to houses before that had six inches in between the bottom of the joist and the top of the soil. And there was actually no way to make the repair. I should say that. I remember coming to one house and there was actually, you could see where someone had crawled underneath the house. There was a path where they had uh, crawled through the house. You could tell that they, they had done it where the soil wasn't perfectly flat, unless of course that was some type of a monster. That's another video that will have to be made in the future. And of course, not around Halloween. Here is another question I received recently. The individual wanted to know if they could cut an opening into a structural shear wall on a concrete foundation. And the first thing I want to point out before we even get started is that I am not providing you with structural engineering advice. I am not an engineer. I cannot do that. You might be better off contacting an engineer um, to uh, figure that out. But I am going to provide you with some information and some of my ideas. You know, if you're just going to do it anyway, I got you. A lot of people um, contact me. They're doing it. Doesn't matter. They're not contacting an engineer. I got that. So hopefully by the time you're done watching this video, at least you'll have a little more information about what a structural uh, wall does and uh, kind of how it would be affected by cutting the opening in and what an engineer might actually want you to do if you um, did actually contact one. So let's go ahead and take a look at a 16 foot wall with uh, let's just say 3 8 plywood and anchor bolts that are spaced about six foot on center. And this is kind of a standard spacing. Most anchor bolts for something like this uh, are probably gonna be more like three or four foot on center. But I just wanted to give you an idea if you ran into something like this, a 16 foot long wall with no hold downs on the end and your anchor bolts are maybe four foot on center, you know, something like this you're going to be is going to be easier to cut a three foot opening into. The longer the wall and the smaller the opening, probably going to be less trouble. Um, the shorter the wall and the bigger the opening is going to be something you shouldn't even do. Now here's an example of a shear wall that is 12 foot long and has the anchor bolt spaced a little closer, 32 inches on center. So something like this might be more important. I mean, you can actually, now on the interior, this isn't gonna be the case, but if you're on the exterior and you come to plywood and you see the anchor bolts six foot uh, apart and uh, maybe the nailing on the plywood is six and 12, six inches on center in the at the, around the edges and 12 inches on center or 10 inches on center in the field studs, then you might just, somebody just uh, put the plywood on as a some type of a protective barrier and it has nothing to do with structural um, shear. It's not a shear wall kind of a thing, but on the interior, you, you have a wall with plywood on it. There's a good chance it's going to be structural. Now let's take a look at a wall that's going to be a little structurally stronger. And that, of course, would be a wall with hold downs that would be attached to some type of a post or even two wall framing studs doubled up. And of course, the larger the post, the larger the hold down should give you a clue that uh, this wall is uh, important. So if you come to a hold down like this, it's a little smaller. Uh, maybe it's all 5 8 bolts, 5 8 all threads, or 5 8 anchor bolts, um, and you have 4 foot spacing or even 32 inches on spacing. This is going to be a little stronger wall than the previous 12 foot wall without the hold downs, telling you that you might not want to cut into it. Now let's make the wall a little stronger. This will give you an example of a larger hold down. And then now we have 16 inch on center anchor bolts. So this right here is going to be a little stronger um, shear wall and uh, something you definitely want to contact an engineer before um, cutting a five foot opening into it. Now here's an example of the anchor bolts that are going through the concrete foundation. And you might have a problem with this if you're going to add 
um, some type of use some type of epoxy system and put your own anchor bolts in using all threads and epoxy is the fact that you might not have a concrete footing underneath it which is what we had here but now I just drew this to give you an idea if you have a wall like this with anchor bolts there's a very good chance you have a concrete footing underneath it and that's because the anchor bolts are going to need something to hold on to so here I'm providing you with an example of what the anchor bolts would kind of look like going into the concrete foundation so you're going to have larger ones where the hold downs are and then smaller anchor bolts where the um, in between the or attaching the plate to the um, concrete now let's go ahead and cut an opening in this wall and this is something that an engineer would probably recommend if you didn't have any hold downs and you had a structural shear wall here with maybe a few anchor bolts holding it in the engineer might require you to put hold downs in in these spots here if you had a hold down at the end and a hold down at the end here you might just need to install two um, new ones now don't be surprised if this is a heavy duty um, wall that uh, for lateral to, to prevent lateral movement side to side movement you might need to remove these you might need to cut into the concrete foundation and install larger hold downs they might want larger post or um, end support studs and uh, so this like I said this is a whole can of worms depending on how bad you want this opening in here um, and you get an engineer involved um, you could and I have trust me I have got the jackhammer out and chipped out big sections of these of the floor so we could put some bolts in there if they didn't have uh, if it wasn't deep enough and again you could have a footing you could have a footing under here and the engineer might want a bigger footing so uh, uh, again you contact the engineer you figure out what it's going to take and then you say you know what it's not worth it I'm not doing it or you you uh, pull the trigger and go for it so here we have two pieces of plywood instead of three so we've reduced our strength which is the reason why we're going to have to put the hold downs in and of course here is the footing like I said you have anchor bolts um, and you have hold downs very good chance you're going to have some concrete underneath it to support it give you a view of what it would look like kind of an x-ray vision view use our superman glasses here and uh, give you an idea we got the bolts going through the post our hold downs connected to our um, anchor bolts and a lot of times you're going to have to have anchor bolts in here like I said and uh, if this was new construction there's a good chance I don't know why they do it but they uh, a lot of times they want an anchor bolt um, plus the hold down bolt and it never made much sense to me you would think the hold down would uh, hold this corner down together so again uh, another thing in there that uh, is confusing with the construction uh, business so that is it for the video I just kind of wanted to give you an idea um, what might be required if you do cut an opening in and uh, I just want to point out again you know the longer the wall and the shorter the opening the better your chances are you're going to be able to do it the shorter the wall if you have a four foot wall with some heavy duty hold downs um, at each side here and you want to cut an opening in here and you got enough room you can just cut these bolts off here cut the anchor bolts off and use this probably not going to happen an engineer is not going to want to do that and there are other things you can do you can actually put moment frames in here you know depending on how much money you have to, and uh, how bad you want this opening in here and how much damage you're willing to do to your house to fix everything and make it work so hope it helps in this video here I am going to provide you with two different methods that can be used to attach the decking to the deck floor joist and of course this is the most common one we have one joist and the two decking planks will join and attach to the same same joist 
and uh, usually you're going to have an eighth of an inch gap between all of the wood, but these gaps can accumulate debris. And of course, the debris can speed up the process of rotting out the wood. And it's not uncommon to have debris accumulate throughout all of the gaps everywhere in the deck and uh, eventually uh, lead to rotting out the joy. So the uh, going and doing some research on YouTube, looking for different video ideas, I came across a method where the individual proposed using two separate boards like this and not having a joist directly underneath the groove. And of course, this would allow debris to fall through and moisture, hopefully um, water when it's raining to fall through here without gathering at the break. So it seems like a good idea. I just kind of wanted to throw it out there see if this is something that makes sense. Uh, the only problem I have with it, an engineer might have a problem with it, but the only problem I have with this is that it might need a couple of drip cuts on each at each break. And without the drip cuts, water could actually roll right over to the joist. And uh, you could end up with a lot of water hitting the framing where you wouldn't have had it before um, with this break here on top of the joist. Now, I say that, you know, the water is going to hit the deck. It's raining. Most of it's going to go right through the gap here. Um, but you are going to have a percentage of it that is going to want to accumulate on the bottom and attach itself to the bottom here and roll towards the joist with the drip cut. It's going to want to roll. It'll hit the, hit the drip cut and then go down. And uh, I have seen these drip cuts. They work great. I've rarely seen a drip cut where the water um, basically goes past it. Um, but I have seen it before. I have actually seen that where um, you have a, a lot of water hitting the um, like a patio deck or something like that. And it will actually go right through the drip cut. So I don't know. This is kind of like I said, this is the only problem I have with this. You know, the drip cuts can be made with a circular saw. Uh, this would be the width of the saw blade and maybe an eighth of an inch deep, something like this. You know, the drip cut can be a half inch over, three quarters of an inch over, but it needs to be, I would say, uh, maybe at least a half inch away from whatever you want to keep it away from. And maybe even farther, you know, you might need to space these boards out farther. The Original video I saw, I think that these uh, planks or the joist were about two inches away from the break. I think they were quite a distance away. And, you know, you do that, you could put a drip cut about a half inch away and that should solve your problem. So an engineer might uh, require these to be bolted together. That's another thing. Engineers going to want to see these breaks nailed to one piece of lumber. They're not going to want to see this and not going to be, you know, this is not going to have a good connection here. And again, I'm not a structural engineer. I can't provide you with the reasons why I can provide you with stuff I've seen in the past. And uh, some of the questions I've asked, I never asked an engineer, you know, hey, wait a minute here. Can this work? You know, um, but again, I don't see a problem with this. You're building an eight foot by eight foot deck off of your house or you know, obviously you wouldn't need it for an eight foot deck. So you're building a 200 foot by 200 foot deck. Um, that's totally different. Going to have to uh, contact an engineer. So anyway, let us know what you think. Good idea. Um, bad idea. You've used it. Uh, if you've used it in the past and you've had great uh, success with it, or you're a deck builder who uses something like this every day in your area, uh, let us know what area you are in. That's another thing, too. I know a lot of people watch these videos and they go, that wouldn't work where I live. You know, something like this might not be necessary in a dry climate. Just don't need to do it. You know, in a wet climate, something like this might make all the difference in the world. In this video, I am going to talk about something that is probably irrelevant to most stair builders, but something I'm going to mention anyway. And that is just exactly what a flight of stairs is. What is a flight of stairs? Is a flight of stairs an individual section of the stairway in between floors and landings? 
or as a flight of stairways, a flight of stairs, a in the entire unit of stairs. So, and this has to do with a landing, obviously not with a straight run set of stairs, but if you have a landing in between floors, so we have the lower floor and the upper floor, and then we have a landing in between. Is this a complete set of stairs that should have the same riser and tread depth, the same width? Is that what this is, or are these two separate flights of stairs? And according to page 278 in the International Building Code Book, 2018 International Building Code Book, it actually says that a flight of stairs is basically a unit of stairs between a landing and a floor. Um, so this would actually be an individual flight of stairs. And this, this would be another flight of stairs. So, so first flight of stairs, second flight of stairs in this situation. Now you're probably wondering what is the big deal here? You know, who, who cares, you know, if it's one flight or if it's uh, two separate ones. But this is where I think it's something that could benefit you in the future if you are a contractor, architect, um, someone who's not real familiar with the building codes. Since it states that uh, a flight of stairs shall have a landing at the top and the bottom. Flight of stairs, landing, floor, landing or floor. Then basically you could change the depth of the tread and the height of the risers. So this stairway here could have a seven inch risers. This one up here could have seven and a quarter inch risers. And you're probably still thinking, what? I'm going to build the stairway with, with the right height risers. You know, they're all going to be uniform and the same. I got you. I got you on that. I would too. But if you were coming to a situation where you had a stairway somewhere and then maybe you had a door. So let's say you had a, um, this was the front of your house and you came up to the sidewalk, went up the set of stairs and then you had a landing or a porch, for example, and then you had a door that went into apartment number one. But then you turned and went up another stairway to apartment number two. And this had seven inch risers. And this one here had seven and a half inch risers or seven and three quarter inch risers. Then this could be a problem, but it's not going to be a problem if your local building department interprets, interprets this flight of stairs as a separate one from this one here. And that's the point of the video. You're gonna to need to check with your local building department um, architects, engineers to verify this information. I'm not going to say that my interpretation is written in stone, but it could actually provide you with a um, way to solve a problem if you're working on a project that um, where this information could be beneficial. So here's a video that I've been wanting to make for quite some time. I went down to the dollar store and bought nine items. The reason why I did that was to keep it under $10 so that I could put a, that in my title on the video. If it would have been uh, 10 items, then I would have had to put $11 in there. Wouldn't have uh, sounded as good. So maybe I'll put $9.99 in there and uh, see if that works. But ten, for a dollar, each one of these gloves, I've seen these in the store for six or seven bucks. Rollers, three or four dollars level you know what's that uh, and this is looks like it's a one foot level for a dollar this might not be the uh, high quality item you know it might not even be level i haven't checked it sandpaper again for a dollar stuff that you know if you think about it these are all items you could put in your toolbox if you're a contractor rope someone else on the job might need it a drop cloth paint brushes and of course, paintbrushes, you know, for a dollar, this one here, um, I'm guessing in the store it's going to be at least five bucks. And, uh, you know, some of these are just hard to wash. It's, you might be using an oil-based paint, and this is going to be the way to go here. Um, and just chuck it when you're done with it. Caulking for a dollar? Come on, you can't even get it 
I don't even know if you can get it for under three dollars anymore. So that is it for my video. Check out your dollar store if you're looking for some items that uh, might save you some money. And uh, I would also suggest checking out your dollar store for uh, other stuff. I was shocked. I've been going to dollar stores probably for about 10 years now. And I'm shocked to see stuff into the store that's a dollar. I was in there the other day and they had a, a gallon of bleach for a dollar. In the store it's uh, almost four dollars. So, you know, check it out. In this video, I am going to go over some of the fixture locations and the length and width along with the door locations and how they can actually create problems um, for your bathroom. Now, I'm not going to, um, you know, provide you with 200 different floor plans. I'm going to kind of stick to this one here and uh, vary from it just uh, slightly. Um, in one or two cases, but your standard bathroom with a bathtub, a toilet, and a sink. This right here and the door coming in here, either the door right here or the door here, is uh, probably the most common bathroom you're ever going to find. And uh, by the time you're done with the video, I think you'll understand why. So five foot is usually going to be the width. Reason for that is because most tubs are five foot wide. If you come to one that is five foot six inches, six inches, or 66 inches, that's probably going to be because the bathtub is five foot six inches, or there's going to be a little tile ledge at the end. Now, the width of the bathroom can vary. For example, seven foot six, I believe, is about the smallest bathroom you're going to have for something like this. I say that all you need to do is put a different sink in, maybe a stand up a pedestal sink and uh, you can make it even smaller. So maybe seven foot's gonna be about the smallest for a bathtub, toilet, and a sink. Um, maybe eight foot to eight foot six is gonna be, will provide you with a larger vanity area. Most toilets and bathtubs are about the same width, 29 to 30 inches here. And then of course you need a 30 inch uh, minimum distance between fixtures for the toilet. So that's kind of a standard. When you make these longer, Usually the only thing you're going to do is uh, benefit wise is to create a longer sink or cabinet. So this one right here, now pay attention. I'm going to flip it over. This is a reverse. And now the reason why I'm flipping them over is just to give you an idea to um, kind of when you're looking at a plan and you're saying, wait a minute, this, this, I, this isn't my house here. This is. Well, all you got to do is flip it over in your brain, you know. And if that's not the case and yours is a little different, maybe it's like this. Or maybe it's like this. So just wanted to give you an idea. You can rotate these around in your mind. Um, you know, maybe you might need to do it on a piece of paper. But there are a lot of bathroom designs that are laid out just like this. And, uh, um, you know, you're thinking yours isn't like that because your door's over here or something. Right. But uh, most of the time they're going to be five foot wide um, by about eight foot. Just flipped around in different directions. So here's a bad design. Now, the reason why I say that is it's going to be perfectly fine as long as you don't put a longer toilet in there or a larger door. You put a larger door and the door swings into the toilet area, you're not going to be able to shut it. So here we have a longer toilet with a wider door. So you can always put a smaller door in um, if you have a wider toilet or a longer toilet, something like this. But this is something you need to think about. Now, when I make my videos, there's a lot of things that I point out in that video. This might be for a design. You know, you're looking at this for design ideas. But if you go to replace your toilet, this is important here. I have replaced toilets before. I've went to people's houses. They buy the toilet. I go to their house and I go, you know what? Not going to work. You know, you're going to have to get a smaller toilet. Uh, not too happy, but uh, as long as I'm not the one who has to take the toilet back, then at least I'm not... Uh, miffed or irritated about that they can be so something definitely 
to think about. And of course, this is what it would look like with a small toilet. And uh, here's what it would look like with a longer one. So you can see where it's going to hit the toilet. Not going to be a good thing. Now let's go to putting the toilet on the other side. This isn't going to be a problem with the door because now the vanity's in here. Now it could be a problem if you're going to get a wider vanity, so that would be something else to consider in your design. I know some people think that they, that they can buy a kitchen cabinet, which might be a little wider than a bathroom cabinet. And that would definitely be um, worth checking before you purchase something like that. So this right here, again, we're back to the standard design that I showed you um, in the very beginning. This one here, you can't walk through. You're going to have a tight spot here. And I'm not quite sure if this needs to be 21 inches, um, but I know the area in front of the toilet needs to be 21 inches. Um, here you have a smaller sink, so I reduced the size of the sink cabinet made a little smaller to make the area a little easier to walk through. This could be a possibility if you want to um, create a design like this. So if you already have an, an existing design like this, um, you know, and I understand it's going to cost a lot to change the plumbing, you're probably going to want to stay with this. Don't, uh, don't change it. Now, this, of course, don't even think about, um, you know, and again, I'm, I got to throw this out there. I've had a lot of people say, can I put the toilet in front of the sink? Well, this is what you're going to end up with in this bathroom. Now, you can always make it a little longer. Um, fine. Now, now you can uh, change some stuff around. 21 inches is the minimum distance in front of a toilet, from the front of the toilet to the finished of area of whatever it is, a wall or a cabinet. So now let's go ahead and we're working with the same width, five foot, seven foot, eight, an inch, inch longer. Um, we got a door in the center, sink and a toilet on the side. So this right here is, is a, another good design, functional. And uh, the only thing I would change with this is I would put the door on the other side because most of the time you're going to come in and use the sink. Um, or the toilet, and you can stand over here and shut the door. So the sink might get used five or six times a day. Toilet might get used five or six times a day. Bathtub once a day, something like that. So you can see where I'm going with. If you have this here, you're going to have to shut the uh, door. Now I have seen, actually lived in a place where the toilet was over here and the sink was over here. And the toilet or the door opened up this way. And that's not that big of a deal. Most of the time when you go to the bathroom, you shut the door anyway. So uh, if you were to re reverse these, then that would probably be acceptable. So this is just it reversed. I got the bathtub over here and uh, the sink and the toilet over here. And the door swing with another... Um, this would be the same bathroom here, and you can see where this is fine. You have the bathroom that's five foot wide, a door on the side, swinging over. You got a sink and a toilet here, so this is a good design. Longer toilet could hit the door if the toilet is over here instead of over here. Now, this right here, probably not going to be as functional. So you can see where if the toilet was over here, it's going to be a little easier. You're not going to have to worry about this distance here. Door location, let's go ahead and change it. I'm going to put the door over here. So this is kind of the um, bathroom layout floor plan that we started with in the beginning, but it would be perfectly fine to have a door located over here. Only thing you're not going to want here is to have the door. Here it's fine. You've got plenty of room. You don't want to have it swinging the other way. So if the door opens this way, great. If it opens this way, it's going to create problems for your towel bar. If you have a towel bar behind the door, and of course, if you could just imagine coming in here. So you're going to open the door. You're going to have to stand in this area to shut it or stand in this area over here to shut it. So not really that good of a design. So here we have the door um, swinging in. I've seen this plenty of times. The door won't shut because there's, uh, or won't close all the way, open all the way, because there's a towel bar in the way or a cabinet or something. And so you're kind of getting into the bathroom over here and then shutting the door 
to use it. So, you know, again, here's the door blocking this off here. You're going to have to stand over here to shut it or you're going to have to stand over here. Here's something that might help some of you who are buying older homes and remodeling them. And that's the fact that some of these older staircases can have extreme wear on the steps. And with that wear, you can end up with some variations between the steps that could create building code problems. And of course, these building code problems might need to be fixed, and in my opinion, should be fixed to prevent the possibility of an accident. So let's go ahead and take our trusty framing square, set it into place. We're going to make a mark on it at the top of each step. And if the stairs were built correctly, then each one of the steps should be the same depth and height. However, you are allowed to have a maximum of 3 eighths of an inch variation in the individual riser height and the tread depth. So here we don't have a problem. Everything's looking good because this section of the stairway doesn't have any wear and tear on it. However, that's not the case down here where we're missing the front nosing, or we have a large section of the step that has split off, or we're dealing with steps that are missing sections that are usually going to be located in the center of the stairway because these are the sections that are going to take the most abuse from people walking up and down the stairway. And over time, those sections can wear, depending upon how many people are using the stairway and for how long. And of course, if we break out our trusty framing square and shove it up tight against the face of the stair tread, which is what the building code is going to require you to do, you can see here where we have a variation. And if this is more than 3 eighths of an inch, you could have a problem. However, what if the rest of the stairway has the same wear on each tread? It's all the same. And we shove our framing square up against the upper step and there is no inconsistency or the entire stairway doesn't have a maximum variation of over three eighths of an inch in the steps. Well, then I'm going to leave that up to your local building inspector and not speculate on it. However, I will speculate on the fact that they're probably not going to be worn the same. Bringing us back to the original reason why I made the video, and that's to make homeowners not really contractors, they should know better, aware of a problem you could run into if you live in a two-story house and you get permits to make remodeling changes to your property. Here's another question I received from one of our viewers. They wanted to know how many different ways you could lay out a gamble roof. And in my opinion, they're almost endless. So let's go ahead and get started with the easiest way possible. And that would be to just simply use a ratio that you're familiar with, like a 12 and 12 and a 4 and 12, and just kind of go and you can start from the center, or you could move this over in either direction to build your roof. And another example of that would be something like this, where we change the roof pitch ratios but left this intersecting point in the center or one fourth of the overall span. We have four five foot increments or we can change it. I can come in six feet and then four feet, four feet and then six feet and use the same ratios. But this really isn't looking like a gamble roof, is it? where an architect or designer might use half of a circle. This is more of a common gambrel roof template. And in this example, we're using four segments that are the same measurements across the span. And that would provide us with a finished roof that would look something like this, with 60 degree angles on each side and 15 degree angles up here. And keep in mind that these ratios might not work out in one inch increments on your framing square. You might be dealing with a three and a half inch and 11 and a half inch ratio. Another way would be to keep the same half circle, but split this up into six segments over the entire span or three from the center and then move this line over to create a roof that would look like this. And if you don't like this one, then let's go ahead and split it up into 10 segments two feet each or five segments from the center to the outside to create this design here. 
And we don't have to stop here. We can use these same increments and move the line over. However, this isn't going to be that much different than the one we did where we have a five foot increment on each side because now we're going to have six feet on this side and four feet on this side to provide us with another roof that might not look like a true gambrel roof. And in our last example, I'm going to go ahead and move this over to the other side to create a roof like this. And you can divide this up into a variety of different numbers and even forget about using the circle here. Or you can forget about what I just said and put this measurement wherever you want to. You don't need to divide it up into any increments. They don't need to be even. You can just simply pick a number that will work for you and use it on both sides or change things up a little bit and create a roof with different measurements like we did here. So this isn't a bad looking roof. And for those of you who need to design something different, then here you go. Or at the very least, now you have a place to start. Here is another question from one of our viewers. They wanted to know how many floor joists they could drill through to install plumbing pipes for a new bathroom remodeling project they were going to do to their home. And obviously I can't provide you with that information. I can provide you with building code requirements. I can provide you with examples on how to install the plumbing, the slope for the plumbing pipes, and different ways to do it. And that's what I'm going to do in this video here. So let's go ahead and pretend like we're going to install a bathroom over here. And there's no way we can possibly get the plumbing pipes through the floor joist and for a variety of different reasons. So let's just go ahead and assume that we can't do anything with the existing floor joist. We're not going to be able to build any drop ceilings to cover any of the plumbing pipes. We don't know what to do. We're kind of in between a rock and a hard spot. And what I would suggest, if that is the case, would be to find out where the plumbing drain goes out of the house or where the plumbing drain might end. And this could be at the back or the front of the house. Your plumbing pipes could drain out of the back of the house or out of either side of your home. However, most of the time they're going to be draining out of the front of your house towards the street and into a sewer. And if that's what you have, you can break out your shovel and start digging a hole around your house and install plumbing pipes from this side not through the floor joist and in some cases something like this is going to be a little cheaper and of course most of the time it will prevent you from damaging your floor joist so let's just go ahead and take a quick tour we're going to need a fitting here this is a combo fitting where we have a four inch pipe on this side, a four inch pipe on this side, and we're coming out with a sweep combo or a long 90. And we're gonna break this down to a three inch pipe. You might consider using a four inch pipe for this. However, in this example here, we are going to go around the house with a three inch pipe. And the minimum slope for the drainage pipe is going to be a quarter of an inch per foot. And you might be able to get away with just installing one pipe. You might need to install another pipe or even a few more. And you can usually do it like this with, again, another combo sweep fitting. Here we're going to have a 3-inch fitting reducing down to a 2-inch fitting. And then a long 2-inch 90 or a sweep 2-inch coming up here. And then we're going to be coming out here with a 3-inch sweep or a 3-inch long 90. Again, another 3-inch long 90. And then we're going to come up to a clean out. We're going to need a clean out at the end of this line here. However, I don't think you're going to need a clean out here. However, However, you would need to check with your local building department to verify that information. And of course, you might need to modify some of the floor framing, some of the wall framing to get your pipes in here. And that might require cutting a notch out of the rim joist or maybe cutting a slot into it. And something like this is probably going to need a strap, especially if you have a break in the wall framing here. But I would imagine you're going to need either a long strap to go all the way through or a strap that's going to go from here to here and then from here to here. So plan on putting some thought into that also. You won't need any straps at the bottom here. However, you might need to install some new sill framing bolts and those bolts might need to be epoxied in and as always the information in this video is not meant to provide you with all the information you need to do something like this however 
it is meant to provide you with a good place to start and another tool for your home remodeling toolbox. Here is some free information, something that a structural engineer might provide you with. And I say that because I'm basing this information off of every stairway I ever built with brackets or dadoed stair stringers. And that would be the fact that I never used anything smaller than a 4x12. And one time I used a 6x14 on a set of stairs that had 22 foot long stringers. So I'm not about to suggest that you can't use 2x12 if the stair stringers are going to be attached to wall framing or if they are going to be structurally supported by a wall or posts. So again, to make myself crystal clear on this one, I am not a structural engineer. I cannot provide you with your exact stair stringer sizes. However, I can tell you that every stairway I built was built out of a 4x12 or larger, even stairs with only a couple of steps.